Well, I've got to stand right here, why don't you? Right here. Yes, right. Wait a minute, where are they facing? Is it like this? Yeah. Okay. Is that good? Yeah. All right. Okay, so. Supposed to button your jacket. Yeah, but Yeah, button your what? Supposed to button my jacket. Yes. So I'm going to read a statement. Jim Griffin will have a couple words to say, and then we'll answer questions. Today, Jim Griffin and I filed a petition based on newly discovered evidence with the South Carolina Court of Appeals to stay Alec Murdaugh's appeal while a hearing is held on a motion for a new trial. Concurrently, we've sent a request to the South Carolina U.S. Attorney to open a federal investigation into the violation of Alec Murdaugh's civil rights. The allegations in the petition filed today speak for themselves, but we believe they explain a number of peculiarities in the six-week trial. We request that SWED stand down on initiating any investigation of these allegations since they are heavily invested in maintaining Alex's convictions. We suggest they wait for the Court of Appeals to rule and receive direction from the trial court. If the Court of Appeals remands the case for an evidentiary hearing, if the, if the Court of Appeals remands the case for an evidentiary hearing, we would also request that those in the media and the public respect the privacy of those included in this filing. Jim and I want to thank those on our team who stand behind us and, and have worked tirelessly to ferret out the truth. Alex Murdaugh maintains, maintained and still maintains his innocence in the murder of Maggie and Paul and believes the truth will ultimately prevail. Jim? The right to a jury trial, stand over here. the right to a jury trial is a fundamental principle of our justice system. Jurors must be free from outside influences and must decide the case solely on the evidence presented in the courtroom, subject to the rules of evidence, subject to the rules of the court, and most importantly, subject to the crucible of cross-examination that's guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution, and that is the right to confront witnesses. When, when a jurors are receive private communications outside the confines of a public courtroom, the Sixth Amendment is violated and numerous other constitutional rights are violated. And that's not Jim Griffin on the law, that is the law of the land. And I want to quote from a decision from the South Carolina Court of Appeals, which is behind me, and states this, where there is a private communication of a court official to members of the jury, an occurrence which cannot be tolerated if the sanctity of the jury system is to be maintained. A new trial must be granted unless it clearly appears that the subject matter of the communication was harmless and could not have affected the verdict. What we had filed today, it, it, supported by sworn testimony of jurors, is that the clerk of court had improper private communications with the jurors and the subject matter the subject matter of those communications was the credibility of the defense that the Murdoch legal defense team put up, and it was the believability of the defendant's own testimony. Now, there's been a lot of said, talked about whether Alex should have taken the stand. I can assure you, I can assure you, when we considered what factors and what we should and should not do and considered whether he should take the stand, we never considered the likelihood as reported to us by the jurors, that the clerk of court would go in to the sanctity of the jury room before he testified and tell the jurors, don't be fooled by his testimony, watch out for his body language, and, and that is what the sworn testimony that we have filed in court today says. And if that is true, which we have every reason to believe that it is, and no reason to believe that it's not, there is no choice but the courts to grant a new trial. Thank you. Any questions? No? Uh -oh. Okay. Uh, when the poor person was pulled away at those bells, did you guys see that or did you find out after the fact? Well, I think we observed it. We did. We, no, I was there. Oh, yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was there. I watched it. But, I mean, look, we're, we were not looking to impute any nefarious conduct. Uh, but clearly, what the, what the jurors reported to us, that they were off talking the four lady and the clerk. Um, I saw them together, but you know, I wasn't watching. I believe, look, I've been doing this 
almost 50 years. The bedrock of any trial, and I've done hundreds of them, is that the quirk of court is the, the person that makes sure the jury gets their food. It's, if, if they're put up for the night, someplace to stay. Their travel accommodations are, are, are met. They're not someone that ever should talk to them about the case. I've never had it happen. Again, I've been doing this for a very long time. Never heard of it happening until this case. And one, one, one thing we want everyone to understand that the clerk of court is an elected official by the people, not appointed by the judge, not appointed by the judiciary. It's a public official who's elected and is an independent state actor. And so that what we are complaining about in the motion that we filed today is the conduct of an elected official, not conduct by Judge Newman or anybody in the unified court system. And, and I think it's important also to understand that she is a state actor, and that's why we forwarded today a letter to the U.S. attorney asking them to open an investigation into the violation of Alec Murdaugh's civil rights by a state actor under, under color of state law. I believe you guys had four jurors that, that you had affidavits for in the paperwork you filed. Did they reach out to you, or did you guys reach out to them? Well, <laughs> this is an interesting story. Let Jim tell you. So um, immediately in the aftermath of the verdict, we um, had received information that, that we needed to look into what happened in the jury room. Um, we uh, started down that road, and, and we met a zone of silence. No jurors would speak to us. And so we were, you know, what I like to call, we were given the Heisman, right? And then when the clerk of court wrote her book, published her book, that zone of silence collapsed. And jurors were upset about that, the ones we talked with, and they were more than willing to come forward and tell us the things <clears throat> that, that we had sort of heard through a whisper campaign. But, and, and so as a result of that, we were able to interview some jurors. Now there's still a number of jurors who maintain that zone of silence, who have not talked to us. We did try to reach out to most all of them that we could get in touch with, but we, you know, the information we got, I can tell you, was independent of each juror. The first juror we talked to, we got information about Ms. Hill saying, don't be fooled. And, and then the second juror, independent of the first juror, says the same thing, and the third juror, independent of the other two, say the same thing. And so we're very confident that the information is accurate. Well, what's and, the expectation and, and, timeline? What, what, what ruling will be? When, what, how fast do you want? Ask them. I mean, that's, we don't have any control over that. We just did receive a notice from the Court of Appeals that the Attorney General has 10 days to respond to our motion. Okay. okay? Now, I think what's interesting to me, again, having done this for so long, is that we, once we had that initial contact with that first juror, uh, we began going around. We had a list and knocking on, literally on Sundays, knocking on jurors' doors, asking them to speak with us. Some of them wouldn't come out. Some of us told us never to come back. Um, but, but some did, and some talked to us. Um, I'll give you an example. And uh, one of the things we heard was once the jury went out, um, even though there were six smokers and they were given smoke breaks during the entire trial, once the jury went out, they were told, no more smoke breaks. No, you're not, you people that want nicotine, you're going to have to get a verdict first. I mean, it's that kind of stuff. Now, that indicates something, and the court would be the one to communicate that. What, why? So, uh, a, a bunch of folks told us stuff that appeared to be um, inconsequential, but in the total context indicated to us uh, that, that what we've put in this petition about the court uh, is credible. Um, and based on sworn testimony from two jurors, um, and we interviewed a third, uh, uh, my paralegal Holly Miller has given you an affidavit or filed an affidavit on what she told us. A lot of these folks just don't want to get involved, but they're going to be involved if we get a hearing because each and every one of them is going to have to testify in an open court before you as to what happened and what didn't happen. It Wait, one at a time. Who? It would appear that Judge Newman was at least aware of some of the allegations that you talked about in your motion. For example, the Facebook post with Juror 785 and the judge actually said, oh boy, I'm not too pleased about the clerk interrogating a juror as opposed to coming to me and having this case. Well, well it, and that's a good point. There's no suggestion that the, 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 the judge did anything 
untoward. But what that does do, if it comes back, he may end up being a witness. Um, so, I mean, it's, but until the Court of Appeals acts, that issue does not have to be dealt with. But if, if the fact is that the court was aware of some of these issues, but still didn't intervene, how concerned are you? We don't know, we, we don't know that he didn't intervene. That's why I'm saying he's a witness. We need to know. that this evidence is strong enough, such that it could have changed the verdict had it been introduced in trial. You know, that's, that's not the legal test. The legal test is, is the subject matter prejudicial to the defense? It's not, would, would it have made a difference in the outcome? Was the subject matter of the improper private conversation material to the defense? If it's immaterial, like, like, what do you want to have for dinner? Um, you know, do you want to take a smoke break? Do you want to go home? Those are immaterial matters. But when the subject matter is, and is reported under oath by these jurors, it was a direction on how you should receive Alec Murdoch's testimony. You should look at him. Don't be fooled by him. That subject matter is absolutely material. That's the core of our defense. And that is something that we had no chance to defend against. And so we strongly believe if that evidence is accurate and the law will require a new trial. If so this is all true, do you, you think the clerk should client? be criminally charged? When was the last time no you spoke with your client, and what has he shared with you with his latest motion? Well, I can't talk about attorney-client privilege information. I can tell you that, that when I shared with him the affidavits, he's a lawyer. He was astonished. He was shaking. He, he was in disbelief. And he thanked Mr. Harpoolian, Mr. Barber, and myself for spending our weekends on dirt roads in Colleton County. And by the way, we've seen more of Colleton County <laughs> on dirt roads um, in places we didn't, we're city boys, we didn't believe existed in this state, um, looking for folks that would talk to us. A lot of doors slammed in our face. A lot of doors slammed in our faces. Do you think Ms. Hill still has a job? I'm sorry? Do you think Ms. Hill should still have her job? No comment. I'm sorry, what? The Facebook posting from the ex-husband of the dismissed juror. There's a lot of detail in there about that. And there's some in-camera transcripts of there as well. But was this not something that actually happened very quickly? The fact that you guys are alleging it didn't exist at all and perhaps was conspired to be created to get this juror dismissed? Yes. I mean, that's a very serious allegation. It's all serious. Everything we've alleged, everything in those affidavits is serious. This is a very serious matter. Um, and again, um, so what, what, what you see in the sworn testimony that's in file, been filed today is Ms. Hill told the court that there was a Facebook post by this juror's ex-husband. The ex-husband has filed an affidavit saying, I've never posted a Facebook post. Ms. Hill in her, in her uh, office says he must have deleted it. We can't find it. But they produced an, a Facebook post from someone with the same name apologizing for an earlier Facebook post and that Satan made him do it and, I, and et cetera, et cetera. And Ms. Hill related that as being this juror's ex-husband. Ms. Hill had this juror's ex-husband's photograph. You can match them up. They don't match. And what we do know, and, and we laid it out in detail in our, in our brief, is that the apology Facebook post was posted, I think, on February 16th and said we had deleted it the day before, February 15th. Ms. Hill is telling Judge Newman on February 23rd that I just saw this Facebook post. Impossible. Impossible. We also have in there sworn testimony that Ms. Hill told this juror that SLED went out and confirmed with your ex-husband that he posted that. Not true, according to the sworn testimony. And, and, and uh, Phil Barber and, and I and Holly Miller from my office went down and interviewed the ex-husband, and he allowed us to, I wouldn't know how to do it, but Phil did, to download his entire Facebook history. None of that is in there. So, I mean, again, we've done what we can do. We're not the police. You know, we've, we have no way to compel anybody to talk to us or give us anything. We've asked very nicely. Now, I will say this. The two jurors that gave affidavits have an attorney, Joe McCullough, who was skulking around here a moment ago back there. So if you want to know about those two jurors, you may want to have a chat with him. What's, what's, the, motiv the, what's the motivation the of the jurors talking to you? Wait, what? What's the motivation, do you think, of the jurors talking to you? Are they upset uh, with the clerk? I think they were upset 
with the way things went. And the, the clerk, I think they may very well, well, yes, they're upset with the clerk. They're upset with the way this played out. Are they regretting their, their vote? Can't comment on that. In the Facebook post, the person who posted the original post, have you ever gotten an opportunity to speak with them? And if so, no. No. I mean, we well, the original post, we don't know whether it ever existed. But, um, but the apology post, did you speak with him, Phil? No. Did we speak with no, him? no, we did not speak. Do you have a timeline from the FBI regarding your request for a new investigation? Well, as you know, having talked to the FBI before, no. <laughs> They're not going to tell us anything. In your letter to the U.S. Attorney, you mentioned the importance of having the FBI investigate as opposed to SLED, for example. Can you talk about the importance of having the FBI involved? Well, having anybody but SLED investigate it. SLED is very invested in this conviction. How invested? Well, uh, the agent, David Owens, who testified under cross-examination by Jim, admitted two things. One, he perjured himself in front of the grand jury. And two, he fabricated evidence. SLED made him this year's Law Enforcement Officer of the Year. So is that the agency that ought to be going to jurors? I don't think so. I think that um, the, the court, whenever if this is remanded back, the trial court should pick somebody else if the FBI is not doing it. Then there are plenty. There's the sheriff's departments. There are other folks, not Colton County, but other sheriff's departments that they could go out and interview jurors or bring them to court. I mean, all these jurors are going to end up testifying anyway. There may not be any reason to go out and interview them. They may just bring, put a subpoena on them, bring them to court. How important is your ability to get jurors to testify in a, under oath in a place where, like you say, it loses zone of silence when they have to go talk to y'all? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean that's something that that. That would happen if we get the hearing that we've requested. That's why we've requested the hearing, so that we can get subpoena power and we, we can get some subpoena, not just individuals come to court, jurors come to court, witnesses come to court, but subpoena records, phone records, for example, uh, uh, emails, for example. I mean, so with a hearing, we have a broad array of uh, assets at our disposal to, to bring evidence to court. Right now, we've got nothing except Dick's Mercedes and uh, Dirt roads in Collin County. And have you heard any jurors who refute what the other jurors are saying? No, we've not had any juror contradict anything what the other jurors are saying. What what you, Jen, what what you saw in our in, in some of the affidavits is, um, the, the jurors were separated in two rooms and sort of broke up from you know guys in in one room, gals in another room. I don't know if that was appropriate. Men in one room, females in another room, and and so the the comments that that we we've, we've gotten on the sworn affidavits come from the ladies' room, if you will, more so than the men's room. But we you know we we do have information that we've submitted from one juror where he he does acknowledge that she talked to him about evidence, about autopsy photos, and don't be upset about them. I mean that should not be happening. That should not be happening. And and, and this juror is a smoker and. You know, he relayed to us basically the coercive effect of people who have a nicotine habit not able to um, smoke until they reach a verdict. Until they reach a verdict, and yeah. so that's what we got. The, wait, wait, wait a second. Yeah. I had an issue with the cable at the very. Could you read that what the initial motion for real time? You had an issue. With Do what now? The, the motion you read. Can you read that? The very first thing. I didn't. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll read it for you after we get done with this, but I, I don't. I don't think I ought to keep the all these folks doing that. Well, you got to you got to get a new trial before you get there, and that's that's not something we're going to talk about today. And yes, ma'am. We don't. We, well, we know we know some of the statements were made in front of the jurors in the one jury room. Now, understand that's I think there are only six jurors in that room, um, or maybe eight. I'm not sure, but but um, not all the jurors would have been present for all the statements. Clearly, they were given in one room or the other. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. So, so, so we have not, we didn't stop investigating, but, but we were hitting brick walls until her book came out. And, and then jurors who obviously were not comfortable with how she handled matters were even less comfortable with her going on a book tour 
and making money off what she did. That that's what was reported to us. Now she has said her book is self-published. That really doesn't sound like somebody who's getting a lot of money. What do you say to that if somebody says, well, she's just self-published? Well, she's trying to make a lot of money. That's the point. I mean, she did. She's trying to make money off of it. She's selling the book. I mean, the question is, was it a successful scheme? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, what if you've read it? I'm not going to give a book review here, but I don't know that you buy the book. I mean, it's not well written. The story they t she tells is not accurate, um, in in our opinion, at least the, the the facts as we saw them. What did you think about the passage? Well, you know, the, the, the problem I have with the, the, what she says in there is, after going to Moselle, Moselle, we, if you notice, she used the plural we, felt such and such and such and such. Is that the jurors in her? I mean, I think that's great cross-examination for her when she testifies in this matter before the trial judge, if the Court of Appeals sends it back. Do you want any hearing in this matter to be public? Absolutely. Absolutely. We want all y'all there. We miss you. Any other questions? Yeah, you said you're investigating. So along your investigations into the alleged jury misconduct and these allegations, have you uncovered any additional things that you would present in a second trial for your defense? Mm, let's not talk about that. Yeah, no. It, it, uh, if we are lucky enough to get a second trial, uh, you have to wait and see. You know, we're not we're not going to disclose any of that today. What, what is your optimism for getting for, for this motion? I am uh, I'm very optimistic that ultimately we will get a new trial. How long that will take, I don't know. Have you tried to reach Clerk Hill ask her any questions about any of this? We, uh, we've not reached out to Clerk Hill. We had reached out to some other folks. And, um, and based on the information we received, uh, we thought it would be pointless to reach out to her. What now? We're focused on getting him a new trial. That's what we've been working on. Anything else? No? Thank you so much. You. Let me give this, read this statement yeah. to him real quick. Sure, sure. Gun. No shit.